We're going to kind of put our, our Ike, our, our intellectuals together. We're going to be smart. Over the course of these last eight weeks, I've, I've been sharing with you, um, I've been trying to do like a creative, uh, more, more storytelling. I want you to be excited about reading scripture, to listen to what I'm saying, kind of go, hmm, that's interesting. I don't remember that. That could be in there, which I hope it is. But to go into scripture and study for yourself to really see what these stories, that these his, his stories, the histories that we're doing from, from Genesis that we're in now, to what they mean in our lives. Are they just cute stories? What are we doing here? And it's the same thing I would do with in student ministry. It is, why are you in this place on this day? And there's so much here as a fellowship of believers, but we don't turn off our brain when we become Christians. Uh, today, we're going to be dealing a lot with a guy named C.S. Lewis, and I'll be honest, when I went to, when I was in, in seminary, I would, we were supposed to read C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity and everything. I love what he wrote, it's called uh, the books of Narnia, they were children's books. When I would start reading Mere Christianity, I don't know if it was the British writing, but all of a sudden I go three pages in and I'm going, I have no idea what I just read. It was, the, the philosophy was, was a little hard for me. But pieces of it, I can understand. So today, if we sat down right now and we went on Google, and Google's a pretty awesome, that's how I decorated our frog. And I had the best costume yesterday, by the way, <laughs> except nobody knew what it was. And I stole it from, I Googled it. It was a, a little piece of paper with a road. It was supposed to be a road and a fork in it. So I was a fork in the road, anybody yeah. see it? I got the same, I got the same thing yesterday. Nobody got it, but it was easy. But if we were to Google the name Jesus, you'd get over 2 billion, billion hits. If you look at Amazon, you get 50,000 results. And given the smorgasbord, which don't exist anymore, remember those, you buffet, of competing views, can we still have confidence in the historical Jesus, who he was? What I've seen on living on different islands, there's such an eclectic group of people, and a lot of times there is a salad bar view of Jesus. When we were in Mexico or living in Honolulu, there was a little bit of Jesus. I'll take this part. I like the lamb. We talked about the, where he goes and saves the lamb. And I like the cool stories about feeding the poor and some of that. So I'll take some of that and I'll add a little bit of some other things. A little you know, mysticism, a little shamanism, a little Mayan you know, stuff. That's pretty cool. We, we don't like some of the other things, maybe his claims. You know, even when he said he was God, big G, um, we like, well, we're all gods, little g. And we, we see this in, in our community and others. He laid it out that he's not a salad bar. He's actually the full meal. He doesn't give us, in a sense, um, the option. Many people want to regard him as not the big G God, but a good, good moral man. And you know, like, oh, he's a wise prophet which forgetting what a prophet means. He spoke some profound truths. And some scholars pass that one off as only an intellectual person, only a smart person you know, can view Jesus as he's just a guy. I mean, you gotta be kind of weird to think of him as God, this triune being. And so people nod their heads, everything comes out, Time Magazine, oh, this and that, talk, belittling Jesus, taking him from the big G to the little G. Just a good guy that cruised around Galilee 2000 years ago. But the problem is Jesus claimed over and over, in fact, one of the gospels, Gospel of John, took some time to say, we just wanna make sure you understand what he's claiming. It's not left to you to say, oh, he's just the, the Jewish Messiah that didn't make it work with Rome. We wanna make sure you understand that Jesus claimed to be God and to him, to Jesus, it was of fundamental importance that men and women either believed in him, to, to who he said he was, or we don't, there's no middle road. There's no wiggle room, no watered down alternatives. The reason is, and there's, a, there's an argument that one who claimed that Jesus claimed that what he said about himself couldn't be a good moral man or prophet, it's called the, the trilemma. C.S. Lewis was, again, a famous author of apologetics. And apologetics is reasoned arguments. You're, you're taking your brain and, and either in a court of law and science, it's the study to prove scripture correct. It, basically, it's a justification of something, of a, of a doctrine. So C.S. Lewis comes along and he 
popularized the argument that Jesus was either, and this is a trilemma, liar, and a lot of you guys have heard this, lunatic or Lord. Thank you. But he didn't invent it. It actually started in the mid-19th century. There's a preacher. Um, sorry, I'm trying to use this thing. It's not working today. And he was um, Rabbi John Duncan. He's a Scottish preacher. They called him Rabbi because he was intellectual. And, and as you know with um, the Judaic system, they study, study, study. They memorize scripture, Old Testament. So he formulated what is called a trilemma. And he basically said that Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud or he was deluded and self-deceived. So either he was a liar or a lunatic, or what is left to us is divine. There's another guy, Watchman Nee in 1936. He made a similar argument in his book called Normal, Normal Christian Faith. A person who claims to be big G God must be one of three categories. First, if he claims to be God and yet is not, he is either a madman or a lunatic. We see this all the time. In Jesus' time, there were other messiahs, guys claiming that they were coming to save the Jewish people. And they ended up poorly. Second, if he's neither God nor a lunatic, he has to be a liar, deceiving people by his lie. We see this. Third, if he is neither a liar or a lunatic, he has to be God. You can only choose one of these three possibilities. If you do not believe that he is God, you have to consider him a madman. And if you can't take either of those two, God or it, you have to take him for a liar. So there is no need for us at this time to prove that Jesus of Nazareth is a God. All we have to do is find out if he's a lunatic or a liar, following the logic. Because, and here we go, and it's better words for C.S. Lewis. Do we have that, that YouTube? And C.S. Lewis said, that, said this here. It's a great little argument. I can do it, but I don't have the accent. Then comes the real shock. Among these Jews, there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. He says he has always existed. He says he is coming to judge the world at the end of time. Now, let us get this clear. Among Pantheists, like the Indians, anyone might say he was a part of God or one with God. There would be nothing very odd about it. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not read that kind of God. God, in their language, meant the being outside the world who made it and was infinitely different from anything else. And when you have grasped that, you will see that what this man said was, quite simply, the most shocking thing that has ever been uttered by human lips. One part of the claim tends to slip past us unnoticed because we have heard it so often that we no longer see what it amounts to. I mean the claim to forgive sins, any sins. Now unless the speaker is God, this is really so preposterous as to be common. We can all understand how a man forgives offenses against himself. You tread on my toe and I forgive you. You steal my money and I forgive you. But what should we make of a man, himself unrocked and untrodden on, who announced that he forgave you for treading on other men's toes and stealing other men's money? As in I impetuity is the kindest description we should give of his conduct. And yet this is what Jesus did. He told people that their sins were forgiven and never waited to consult all the other people whom their sins had undoubtedly injured. He unhesitatingly behaved as if he was the party chiefly concerned, the person chiefly offended in all offenses. So this makes sense only if he really was the God whose laws are broken and whose love is wounded in every sin. In the mouth of any speaker who is not God, these words would imply what I can only regard as a silliness and conceit unrivaled by any other character in history. Yet, and this is the strange, significant thing, even his enemies, when they read the Gospels, do not usually get the impression of silliness and conceit. Still less do unprejudiced readers. Christ says that he is humble and meek, and we believe him. 
not noticing that if he were merely a man, humility and weakness are the very last characteristics we could attribute to some of his sayings. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish things that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic, on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't, I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. Now it seems obvious to me that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend, and consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Is this a good argument? Amen. Thank you. If Jesus were not, the argument is this, if Jesus were not Lord, he would be a liar or lunatic. Jesus was neither, you gotta brush up your head for that college logic, was neither liar nor a lunatic. Therefore, Jesus is Lord. To determine this argument, so one, are the terms clear? Pretty clear. Is the logic valid? It does follow. Are the premises true? So I would give, yes, the terms are clear. Yes, the logic is valid, rules of modus tollens. But, one second, the argument is unsound because not all the premises are necessarily true. William Lane Craig, brilliant, points out in the book Reasonable Faith, the first premise leaves out other possible options, and that's why this trilemma has changed. Liar, lunatic, lord, legend. That's the other alternative. The Jesus presented in the Bible is not the true Jesus of history. He may not be a liar, lunatic, or a lord, but rather he's just legend. In other words, the Jesus of the Bible is not to be the Jesus of history. So our claims about must be true about the Jesus of the Bible do not lead to the logical conclusions about the absolute and actual lordship of Jesus. But here C.S. Lewis comes in again, and I'm reading this more today because I want to be concise and clear. He himself worked through some of Jesus' startling claims in Scripture, repeating his insistence that you can't conclude what we have just said. He says they're a megalomaniac, that he's crazy. But he says this, in my opinion, the only person who can say that sort of thing is either God or a lunatic suffering from the form of delusion. It undermines the whole mind of man. So let me go on. We may note that he was never regarded as a mere moral teacher in history. He did not produce that effect on any of the people that actually met him. He produced three effects. One, absolute hatred. They hated him. The rabbis, the ruling leaders of the time, hated him. They killed him. They, they tried and then they killed him. So there's terror that he would have done something that's going to get Rome ticked off of him. We hate this guy because what he's saying about God. We are a monotheistic culture. The Jews were monotheistic. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one God. They fought and died for it for thousands of years. This dude comes along, hey yo, I am. <gasps> Ripping their clothes. Terror, he's gonna mess up our thing with Rome. Or adoration, the people that were following him. There was no people just cruising along, mild approval. His enemies knew exactly what he was saying about himself. You only need to see their reactions. Ultimate anger is tearing of their garments. Kill him, chanting, kill him, plotting. His basic blasphemy, calling himself God. 
But then again, did his followers afterwards exaggerate the stories? Let's, let's, Jesus is dead. Let's make up something cool. Let's get something from this. Well, we remember it is amazingly unlikely for his disciples to invent God becoming man. They're Jews. And just being over there a few months ago, there's this adoration for Yahweh, and they won't even put a picture up. There's no pictures of Moses. They didn't have artwork. They wouldn't write his name in the Torah, God's name. They moved around it. Absolute adoration for one God. Jews aren't going to make this up. They belong to a nation that, of all others, was the most convinced there's only one God that couldn't be another. It would, it's very odd that this horrible invention of a religious leader saying he's God should grow up among the one people in the whole earth least likely to make that mistake. Also, when you're reading the history, you get the impression that none of his immediate followers accepted it too easily. They had a hard time with it. They didn't embrace the doctrine of the Trinity easily at all. It took some time. And honestly, it was after he rose from the dead that he needed something miraculous. Even though he was healing, they needed more. And the last one, we're not going to full apologetics class. We can do this on Wednesdays. But another evidence is the way the followers lived their lives after his resurrection. And I'm not just talking about the 12. Well, Judas is out, but they added another one. 11 of those guys were executed. Now, at some juncture, as they're cruising to be crucified upside down, beheaded, whatever the way they're going to get killed by Rome, they're like, whoa, let's just stop this for a second. His body's over there. It's, it's right there. They, they could have stopped. They didn't. History. The other one is much later, you know, hundreds of years later, they started drawing as legends. And this is what's neat what C.S. Lewis called, says. Now remember C.S. Lewis, who was his best buddy? Tolkien, Lord of the Rings. They were medieval scholars. They knew legend. They knew it. They knew what legend set, reads like. I've read legend. We all did growing up. He says this, I am perfectly convinced that whatever else the Gospels are, they are not legends. I have read a great deal of legend, and I'm quite clear that they are not the same sort of thing. They are not artistic enough to be legends. From an imaginative point of view, they're clumsy. They don't work up to things properly. Most also of the life of Jesus is unknown to us. In legend, you have some sort of a buildup. We don't have it. Yes, some Apocrypha started adding some stuff later, like, oh, he went to Egypt, let's make him this way. But the accepted canon of the history of Jesus doesn't do that. There's no literature like the Gospels until about 100 years ago when we started with historical novels. So let's just go down. So this is something to stew on. This is something to work with, okay? But again, the point is, how does it apply to me and my relationship us today and we always come to the real question that every Sunday what do we do with this Jesus what do we do with him and the choices are the same as they were 2,000 years ago the rabbis did get rid of him delete him let's live our life without that guy without that God let's just go you know whatever whatever we don't care they, the Jews say hey let his blood be on us we don't want to accept him we're not dealing with them I don't want to happen with it. It's not going to happen. One, bury him. As the apostles first did, imagine those three days. We're celebrating communion, the last supper that they had together. We had three days of agony. We thought this was going to be something different. Just bury him. Just, well, they're good stories. Imagine what the apostles were feeling for those three days. Well, we can get some morals out of it. I mean, you know, it should be good to your neighbor. You know, and on a side note with this, going back to legends, these are the guys that wrote them. If I was going to write it, it's kind of like my water polo history. I kind of make it better than I was. If I was Peter writing this thing, I'm not going to put certain things in. John, I'm a little naked there. You know, you, you, you make yourself a little bit better, in, as some of us are older now, in your mind. I was better in my 20s. They would have put that in. They don't come across so great. So, or we worship him. And this is one of the great, great verses. One of the, the apostles, Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas because he was doubting. He wasn't there when the, the other disciples were seeing Jesus. And they're telling him about it. And he's just going, E.K., no way. Intellectually, I can't accept this weird story. It's implausible. I'll only accept this when I touch him and feel him. So in, in Scripture, it goes this. He said, 
Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. And the other guy said, hey, we've seen the Lord. He's like, sure. And he said to them, unless I put the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I won't believe. That's pretty gross. I need some real world truth here. I mean, you guys, I like you guys. You're good guys, but you're a little getting kooky. Okay. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Through, though the doors were locked, so they're still a little haired out. They're locking their doors. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it at my side. At this juncture, Thomas is like, Ugh. So he does it. Reach out your hand. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Don't call me God. No. He said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believed. My Lord and my God. He accepted the title, my Lord and my God, with which Thomas identified him with. For us in this room and on Zoom, what title do you give him? What do you call him? Liar? Lunatic? Legend? Or is he our Lord? So as we come to the table, today in Latin countries where I am from, it's Dia de los Muertes. It's the Day of the Dead, or it's a Mexican holiday celebrated, and it's a Catholic, Catholic celebration of All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And when I first started working in Mexico 30 years ago, it's a multi-day holiday. I didn't know what it was. And you go into some of these restaurantes, the restaurants, and you're like, there's freaky looking skeletons and marigolds and I if you go over next to Akamai Juice there's they have a little setup for Dia de los Muertes for and you're like what is this why are the kids dressed in skulls is this evil and it isn't it's a day to to celebrate family and for me we we look at it it's a it's a it's a Christian celebration but it's a day to celebrate Christ and family and family that have passed on and for me, it's family that brought me to have an understanding of Jesus. The Christian celebration of All Saints Day is, stems that there's a bond at this time between the church triumphant and the church militant, the living church. Isn't that interesting? There's a church triumphant in Catholic theology, those are in heaven, and the church militant, soldiers of Christ. That's misused a lot of times. It means we have our marching orders. And that theology, it, it commemorates all those who have it's a beatific, I said that wrong, but it's a vision of heaven. They, in Reformed theology, for us, 500 years ago and 501 years ago, um, it's giving God solemn thanks for the life and death of his saints. Who are saints? All those who have accepted Jesus Christ. Including, as it says, those who are famous or obscure. You are, are the saints. We are the church. As such, individuals through the church, universal are honored, and this is what happens. So today, every communion, we, we think of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. Today also, think of those who 